صداقت اسلام کچھ بھی ہو جائیں گے ہم جہاں بھی کے جانا پڑے جائیں گے ہم جہاں بھی کے جانا پڑے ہمیں السلام علیکم ورحمۃ اللہ وبرکاتہ فیوز ویلکم ٹو بیکن آف ٹروتھ این انٹریکٹیو شو ان وچ وی ڈسکس دا ویریس کنٹیمپری ایشوز سراؤنڈنگ آر سوسائٹی اینڈ دا لیٹسٹ نیوز ہیڈ لائنز اینڈ گیو اٹ این اسلامک پرسپیکٹیو ود دا ہیلپ of our panelists. Now, viewers, remember you can call in or you can leave us with your comments and questions via Twitter, Instagram, email, and our landline. The three pieces that we shall be discussing in the, today's program are as follows. The first one, which has been published by Swiss Info, is regarding a survey carried out in Switzerland where two thirds of the population, rather two thirds of a, out of 15,000 people, consider Islam not to be a relig religion. The second article that we will be discussing is, has been published by Daily Mail regarding a family living in Bradford who converted from Islam to Christianity and faced persecution in result of it. And the third article is about a secret school for teen extremists in Britain. We shall be discussing that last, inshallah. On our panel today, we have with us Abdul Qudus Arif Sahib, who is a professor at Jamia Ahmadiyya UK, the educational institute of the Ahmadiyya Muslim community. And next to him, on the far left, we have Mubashar Zafri Saib, who is a student at this institute at Jamia Ahmadiyya UK, currently studying in his sixth year. Now then, let's get right into our conversation for today. As I mentioned, the first article is regarding a survey carried out in Switzerland. Now, two thirds of the population, or two thirds out of 15,000 people, consider, do not consider Islam as a religion, nor do they think that it has a place in their country. What's our opinion on this? Um, the first thing which uh, comes to my mind is that what's the aim of this particular vote or poll? What they're trying to achieve? Uh, by the looks of it, it seems that they don't want the Islam to be in Switzerland, first of all. They don't think that Islam should pra be practiced. Is that what they're trying to achieve? So we're quite unclear about what they're trying to achieve in this particular vote. And secondly, do the whole of Switzerland or the population of Switzerland hold this view? Because as you rightly mentioned, it's only 15,000 people who took part in this vote. So does that represent all of Switzerland? Does all of the Swiss people think that Islam shouldn't be a part of Switzerland? So the first thing is to, you know, come down and understand what they're trying to achieve out of this vote. And once that's been achieved, then you can, you know, further talk what, what the reasons for this. And as you mentioned, that most of them think no. Now, we need to think what they're trying to achieve, you know. Why do they want there, there to be no Islam in Switzerland? Does that mean that, you know, Muslims can't live in Switzerland no more? Does it mean that Muslims living there are not allowed to do certain things? We already know there's, you know, minaret bans in Switzerland. So what's, what's the aim of this vote? Now... So do you think that <coughs> it would have been better not to carry out the survey in the first place? Uh, it could be. I mean, first you have to accomplish what your aim is. If you, you know, explain that this is what you're trying to achieve. Because with votes and polls, you know, you can twist the questions. So if it was clear that what they're trying to achieve, it would have been better. You know, to have an open poll, you can tell, you know, you, you can't be sure what the outcomes will be. So that's what I think. I mean, if they had made it clearer, it would have been, you know, easier for us to understand. And just continuing from Mubashir, um, Daniel, I think um, the Islam that is being portrayed uh, in the media and the Islam that is unfortunately prevalent in, in, in society as a whole is the reason why a majority of these individuals uh, are polled against it and, and basically said that it shouldn't be recognized as a religion within the Switzerland state, which is understandable. Why do I say that? Because if you look at terrorist organizations such as Daesh, Al-Qaeda, the Taliban, or other Islamic states who aren't as extreme as these terrorist organizations but still hold extreme views with regards to certain policies. Now, if they are the ones that are viewed as Muslims, then of course, Switzerland has a right to reject that. If I was a Swiss national, I would also reject that very concept of Islam. But if you look at the Islam 
that was brought by the Holy Prophet of Islam and the Islam which is found in the actual source, which is the Qur'an, the primary source of Islam, then that is Islam that should be welcomed rather than which should be you know, taken away from a particular country. So if that's the Islam we're talking about, that which is spread in the world today and which is causing chaos and disorder in the name of Islam, then I'll be 100% behind these individuals. But as Mubashir was saying that what is the purpose or the result, the outcome of this poll? What is it to achieve? It's just stirring up a debate for absolutely no apparent reason. It, it actually, again, disenfranchises a particular group of people. It segregates them. It makes a concept of you and us. And when these sentiments are being voiced across the world now, there's an air which is about extremism, about radicalization. And this rhetoric by some Western countries plays into the hand of those individuals that are radicalizing the youth and radicalizing Muslims that look, that the places that you live and call your homes don't even accept your religion. So all these things need to be understood that if this poll was actually resulting in something far better and, pe and going towards a peaceful society, then it's understandable, then it's a good thing. If it's not achieving that, then anything which you know, puts disunity, discord in society should be rejected, in my personal opinion. Right, so in essence, what both of you try to say here is that the actual survey didn't really have a result where it would take the country forward, a step forward, rather it would take it a step back by creating chaos and disorder. Yeah, just continuing from this side, um, the, the, we see that you know, in the world today, people have this issue that Muslims are integrating with society. And the main cause is because you know, they have their own, you can say malice, they have some sort of um, hate against Islam. And therefore they present such ideas, which causes Muslims you know, not to socialize or not to integrate with them. So the whole essence of integrating is you, know, you accept others. If you start putting bans on, if you start you know, saying that you know, there's no need or there's no place of certain religion, it could be any religion, it doesn't have to be Islam. I'm just, you know, Islam is just the one that's an issue at the moment. You, if you state that you know, there's no place for you, how are you going to integrate? You know, the whole essence of integration is then lost. So for us to integrate, you know, we need to be accepted. And if there's no exception by you know, the other party, then how is this integration going to work? It's not going to work at all. Yeah, and I personally think that <coughs> what the MD Muslim community is trying to achieve is that build, that, build those bridges. You know, these bridges were built at the time of the Promised Messiah, alayhi salatu wasalam, where he said that instead of focusing on the negatives of a particular religion, look at the positives. Every religion should come forward, present their ideologies, present their, um, their doctrines from their own scriptures, and highlight the positives instead of looking at other religions, other people, and only focusing on the negatives. Now, if you want a society to work, if you want a people, nations to come together, then these are the principles that we have to adopt. It, whether it be Switzerland, whether it be United Kingdom, whether it be America. If you're going into the rhetoric of putting up walls, putting up boundaries, then unfortunately you're, you're, you're segregating people from other people and causing this disunity, which in this day and age we do not need. We're already living in a society where it's divided and it's going to, into further division. Why are, we, why are you walking towards this? Why are we going towards this? Let's reel back a bit and focus on our, as a, as a human race, what are common between us, focus on that and achieve this peace that we, we require so much in this day and age. And this is a message that it's not I'm saying, this is a message that of course, has Khalifa al Masih al-Khamis, the fifth caliph of the Promised Messiah, alayhi salatu wasalam, has been, you know, literally going to every country of the world and telling those people, the policy makers, influential people, the academics, that you have to practice this for world peace, for peace in society, not world peace, the peaceful peace in society in those areas. It is necessary that you look at the positives of every, every person and take that on board and then move forward. Right, Qudu Sahib, it's great that you mentioned the Ahmadiyya Muslim community because we have a Murabi, a missionary and an Imam um, on the line who's from Switzerland. Murabi Sahib, is, uh, his name is Irfan Takr Sahib. And, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, Irfan Sahib. 
Irfan Saib, I'm sure you've read the article as well. My question to you is, what is the Ahmadiyya Muslim community doing to counter the, these sort of opinions against Islam in your country? Well, um, on our scale, we are trying to do our best. We're facing a few um, problems, difficulties. Uh, for instance, we cannot openly go to anybody on the, on the streets and have a leaflet containing any information about Islam. So we're putting them in the mailboxes. Now I think it's the duty of the Swiss citizens to take a step and learn about what we give uh, to them. But uh, also, um, Islam, I think, uh, is accepted as being a religion amongst the citizens, as I see here. Um, and now, uh, you know, it's uh, portrayed by the media and politicians that it's a you know, a source of conflict and bad religion and all this. Uh, the reason being, um, I don't know whether or not if it's uh, just a hate campaign to get votes or to make a diversion, and uh, so that you know the real questions don't come up, such as tax evasions problems and other kinds of um, injustice. But uh, you know, you see that there is two types of citizens here. The more uh, educated they are, the more broad-minded they are, the more. Um, you know, peaceful and accepting they are. I've, I've, I live in a very small town now. It's just 24 um, kilometers square. And in, t in December 2014, it's, they counted 2,340 people here. And I must say that they all are nice, kind, smiling, and with a lot of courtesy. So, you know, I don't think it's fair to uh, paint everyone with the same brush. Um, of course, there are other places like Ticino in uh, Italy. People are misled there. So obviously, you know, they are brainwashed with the medias. But um, I think more and more people in 2016 are aware of uh, the real values that Islam teaches. And we are trying our best here to make, you know, uh, efforts so that people actually learn about the values and the peaceful teachings Islam uh, has. Right, so Irfan Saab, you mentioned that you live in a small town. And as this article states, this survey was carried out with a relatively small amount of people as compared yeah. to the population of the country, 15,000 people. Mm -hmm. So do you think that portrays the sentiments or the opinions of the whole nation about Islam or not? I really don't think so because I live near uh, Geneva. I've been there as well. And Geneva is a, such an um, international city because there is people coming and going from everywhere. And my experience was that people are re really, really broad-minded. And, you know, first of all, the thing is that, you know, uh, they don't actually care about religion that much. They care more about um, human rights. So um, I'd rather say that two-thirds of Swiss people don't even care about religion. And I'm talking about citizen uh, citizens in 2016. Uh, they used to be believers, of course, but the times change and people gave up on religion. May it be Christianity or Judaism or uh, other faiths. Uh, the reason being, of course, the worldly matters, lust of money, power, greed, health, wealth. Uh, and I'm talking speci um, especially about the Geneva region. So whether it's Islam or Christianity, I think that's not actually relevant. Um, people are going further from God and places like churches and temples are completely deserted. So much so that uh, there is a massive number of churches that are being sold in Switzerland because they cannot afford uh, the whole church for just the dozens of worshippers. You know, that's how bad it is here. Right. Well, I guess we're fortunate that Islam promotes human values and human humanity as a whole. Jazakallah, Irfan Saab, we'll be moving back to our uh, panel now. Um, my next question regarding this topic is that often we see that the question arises whether there's, the religion should interfere with the state. Isn't this a matter where the state is interfering with religion? Yeah, I mean, Daniel, it's emphatic no that religion and state should always remain apart. Every, any time, uh, if we look at especially European history, where religion has inf interfered, with the state, especially talking about the Inquisition, the church, church's history, it's not been successful. I mean, it's unfortunately painted a very negative picture of, of Christianity. And whereas Christianity is also a religion, 
uh, which has peaceful teachings. And the Messiah, of course, came to reunite the lost you know, sheep of Israel. So having said this, we know that at the time, at this, especially this time, religion and state should never you know, you know, interfere with each other. The, the state has no right to question you know, certain religious practices or symbol unless, and this is a big unless, unless that religious practice or so-called religious practice is directly having a negative effect on citizens, on, their, on the safety of citizens itself. Even in this article, Daniel, I think they were interviewing um, the, the, the party leader, the social party leader, far-right party leader um, in Switzerland. And he said that if we do not accept Islam as a religion, then unfortunately people from outside of Switzerland will radicalize and, and build up certain bridges, uh, to take up certain bridges and ensure that Muslims are, are, are targeted and, and, they're, and they're radicalized as well. Whereas this is not the case, I mean, I agree with him. He says that, you know, that we should focus on certain Imams and see what they're saying and, and see that whether they're going against the state or not. So whereas the state's position is concerned, if they're looking out for the citizen, for, the, for, the, for society as a whole, and ensuring that there's peace within society, they have every right to interfere. That is something which our beloved Imam, Hazrat Mizan Musul Ahmed, may Allah be his helper, has continually said as well, that if you see that Imams and mosques which are close to the public, they should be opening up. And the government and people in power, they have the right to keep a vigilant eye upon these people. Because if they're preaching anything against the state, then that's going to cause discord in society. Having said all this, the fundamental Islamic teaching, or one fundamental Islamic teaching, is hubbul watani min al-iman. That love of, na of the nation, of one's nation, is an integral part of faith. Now, even in this day and age, we're practicing this. We ha today, we, we, there was a Remembrance Day. There was ha thousands of Muslims, MD Muslims, who were out collecting for the public appeal, remembering those fallen veterans which, you know, who served their nation for, for the protection of our rights. So ha we, have to be, we have to strike a balance. You can be a leader of the far right, but say, say something which is so poignant and, and so to the point that it's worth you know, acquiring and following as well. Right, well Zafri Saib, if we take a look at the world today, we see that there's a huge picture depicting Islam as a religion of extremism and terrorism. But hundreds of years ago, Islam or the Muslims who were in materialistic senses successful at that time, were seen completely differently, as in the opposite of what, what it is today. What I have mean, you got to say on this? Looking at the world today, um, a very bleak picture of Islam is painted across media, you know, across the world. And when we really compare that to the times of the Prophet ﷺ, and after that, you know, the different caliphates that came after the Holy Prophet ﷺ, it was a completely different picture. I mean, the time of the Holy Prophet ﷺ, you know, you know he, when he went to Medina, he was seen as the leader of Medina. And he set up a council there, you know. And, you know, the chart of Medina is well, you know, renowned. renowned. And all the democratic system is based, essentially, on that charter. And we see that at the time of the uh, the Holy Prophet ﷺ, when he migrated to Medina, there were Jews living there. And they also accepted the Holy Prophet ﷺ as their leader. And in the Charter, the Holy Prophet ﷺ stated that Jews, they can live in Medina with peace with the Muslims, and so can the Muslims. And when it comes, when the point comes where the Jews are being attacked, the Muslims would go and defend the Jews. And if the Muslims are being attacked, the Jews would come and help the Muslims. And in the same way, the Muslims aren't you know, they shouldn't be friends with the, uh, the enemies of the Jews. Rather, they should be allies of the Jews living in Medina. And the same uh, teaching was practiced by uh, you know, the Holy Prophet's Khalifas, the Khalifa that came afterwards. They practiced the same thing. We see when, uh, in the time of the Umar Dalanho, when he conquered um, Israel, the Sy Syria, Israel, all that area, when he went to Eliyah, known as uh, um, Jerusalem now, he went to one of the, you know, the holy sepulchres there. And he offered his, uh, you know, um, he went and met the priest there and the time of namaz came, the uh, time of prayer came and the priest there suggested that you know, if you want to pray here you're more than welcome to pray but Hazrat Umar refused and he said that if I pray here today then later on in the future 
maybe the Muslims turn this, uh, may, you know, convert this into a mosque. So he protected the rights of the Christians then as well. And we even see that um, there's so many Orientalists, you know, not, not Muslim, non-Muslim Orientalists, historians, they've commented on this, you know, vastly. They've said, they've, you know, mentioned that Islam was a religion of peace and they, you know, acted justly. Uh, just to name a few, I mean, I've got one here. Uh, Will Durant, he's an American historian, he says in his book, The Story of Civilization, and he says that at the time of the Umayyad Caliphate, the people of the Covenant, Christians, Zoroastrians, Jews and Sabians, all enjoyed a degree of tolerance that we do not find even today in Christian countries. They were free to practice the rituals of their religion and their churches and temples were preserved. So this is what we see in the time of you know, the people who actually practice the true teachings of Islam. And if the true teachings of Islam are practiced, then this sort of justice would be seen in the world. Right, Jazakallah Zafri Sahib. Let's close our chapter on this story now and let's move on to our next piece for today, which, as I mentioned, was published by Daily Mail, where a Muslim family living in Bradford converted to Christianity just over 20 years ago and faced persecution in result of that. Now, my question is, living in a predominantly Christian or non-Islamic country, is it not shocking to hear that someone who converted to Christianity is being persecuted? Well, the answer is yes, of course. I think regardless if it's any country of the world, it's shocking. Um, you know, no religion ever promotes this, where if someone leaves their religion or converts to another religion, they should be you're persecuted in any sort of way. Um, so it's, it's an emphatic no, Daniel, for your first question. <laughs> that's, that's, that's fine, but as we have some questions on Twitter, and they all come back to this very point that it says, if they renegate, seize them and kill them wherever you find them. They quote that from the Holy Quran. What's the answer to this then? Daniel, the fundamental principle of the Quran with regards to religion is la ikrah fi deen, which is from the chapter, chapter 2, verse 257 of the Holy Quran. That there is absolutely no compulsion in religion and its matters. You're free to practice how you want. You're free to choose your religion. You're free to not choose a religion. You can be an atheist. You don't have to follow any sort of religion, but the choice is yours. And Islam promotes that choice. And you know, there were examples given at the time of, of the, the Holy Prophet وسلم, where in Medina, um, Bashar talked about the Jews, but there were rights for those people who, did not, who were pagans, who were idolaters, who had no religion. They also had the same, they enjoyed the same rights as, as humans. And as a Muslim, there's only two purposes that a Muslim is meant to do. Or, or for his religion, is to serve his creator and serve his creation, the creator's creation. And by serving his creation, it, it doesn't say that you have to serve Muslims only. There's no distinction of religion, caste, creed, colour, but it's, you have to be a servant of humanity as well. So any, anything they present from the Qur'an can easily be rebutted from the Qur'an itself. The, 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 the verse that is under question has been cherry-picked. If you read the context of where this verse is mentioned, it talks about those individuals that have caused great, they've they been treacherous to the state. Even today, the punishment for treachery is what? It's capital punishment. If you are treacherous against a nation, you're going to be questioned. And you're going to be, you have to suffer the, uh, the, the consequences. Similarly, if someone was treacherous against the nation of Islam at the time, which was Medina, then of course there were consequences that you had to face, which is the part and parcel of every society. So to cherry pick a verse like that is incorrect. There's other verses of the Quran as well, I think we, we can get into later if, if we have time, but we can, which says that, you know, you can apostatize from Islam, but you can convert back to Islam, then you can apostatize again, and you convert back, but then on the third time when you, when you, when you reject Islam, and you stick to that, then your, your matter is God, with God alone. If someone who was an apostate, uh, 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 one who committed apostasy, if he was to be killed straight away, then how would he have the second chance of converting back to Islam? Then the third chance, then the second time where he apostatized, and then convert back to Islam. I mean, these these things that are often found within within uh, some Muslim uh, schools of thought are unfortunate, and it's completely against the Quran and the practice of the Holy Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Right, you say that it's against the practice of the Holy Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. But in Bukhari, we find, and this is another question on Twitter, that can you please explain the following hadith: Whoever changed his Islamic religion, then kill him. What's our response so, to yeah, that? So the hadith: When man badala dinahu faktuluhu, it's a very known hadith, and people, especially those who allegate against Islam, use this verse, stating that 
clearly the Holy Prophet وسلم, said that whoever changes his um, or changes his um, religion should be killed. So the first thing is that uh, we see that the word deen has been used in this hadith. And we know that the Holy Prophet وسلم, was very particular about the words that he used. And if we look at this, we see that Islam hasn't been mentioned at all. It clearly says that whoever changes his religion should be punished with death. Now, this completely goes against the teachings of Islam because we believe that Islam is a mission and religion. We go out, we preach. Essentially then, if you're looking at this hadith, it means that anyone who converts from their religion should be punished. So that means we're putting a ban or we're putting you know, limits on our own religion, or our own teachings that we should go out and preach. Because if a person is converting from Christianity to Islam, he's changing his religion. If it's a person who doesn't believe in, you know, if it's a Jew, he's converting to Islam, he's changing his religion. So according to this law then, we should be punished with death. But uh, does that mean that this hadith is wrong then? Did the Holy Prophet ﷺ not say this? Because it's mentioned in Bukhari. See, the thing is, what well, the Masih Mother says Islam, the Prophet Muhammad has said about hadith, is that it's not the first thing that you look at. The ruling subject, or the ruling thing that, you know, that we look at is the Qur'an. We believe the Qur'an to be the hukum, the, the one Quran who decides, overrules, every over, other overrules everything. Teacher. And now if, if uh, looking at the teaching of the Prophet Muhammad he has said that no matter how correct the comprehension or the narration of the hadith is, if it goes against the teachings of the Qur'an, we don't accept it, whether it's been mentioned in Al-Bukhari or it's mentioned in Sahih Muslim or any other you know, um, hadith book. If that's going against the teachings of the Qur'an, then we do not accept it. Right, well, a question on Twitter is that if the Holy Qur'an does not teach death as a punishment for apostasy, then where did this teaching come from? Daniel, the teaching has been misconstrued like so many other teachings. For example, you have the teaching of jihad, you know, which unfortunately has been misconstrued to this day and age. And because over time, unfortunately, the Muslims lack the understanding of the Qur'an, because the Qur'an itself says that only those can truly benefit from the Qur'an that are pious and righteous. Now, since it was as prophesied by the Holy Prophet of Islam that there will be ulama, there will be scholars of Islam, but they will not be guiding people, but rather leading them astray. This is a perfect example of that moment, where an injunction so clear of the Qur'an, you know, has been completely abandoned, and a hadith which is far inferior to the Qur'an, because the Qur'an is the word of God, and hadiths which were collated approximately 150 years after the demise of the Holy Prophet and through narrations. I'm not, I'm not disregarding them completely, but I'm telling you the, the status of the Qur'an as compared to the hadith. Now the hadith can say all it, whatever it wants, but if it goes even an iota against the teaching of the Qur'an, then it's unacceptable, whether it be from Sahih Bukhari even. This is something that the Hakam, the Adil of the time told us, the Arbiter, the Judge. And who is that Judge? The Holy Promised Messiah, Hazim is Ghulam Mehmud Qadian alayhi salatu wassalam. He says that if the Qur'an says something, then without a shadow of a doubt, that is to be accepted. And any Hadith which contradicts the Qur'anic teaching has to be abandoned. Saying, or having said all this, we have to see the Sunnah, the practice of the Holy Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa which is key to this teaching as well about apostasy, which will again highlight what Islam's true teaching is with regards to this. One great example that for me always amazes me is the one about Hazrat Abdullah bin As-Sarah, who was a Qatib of Ahi, who used to write down the Quranic uh, revelation that was, uh, was given to the Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. There was a distinct number of 10, which the Ahadith say. Now he was, Again, he was called for duty, and the Holy Prophet ﷺ was telling him, this was, these were the verses revealed to me. It was, it was the few, the initial ayats or verses of uh, Surah Al-Mulk. And Hazun went up to a certain point, he narrated a verse, and then without, insta uh, spontaneously, Hazrat Abdullah bin Sarah said that, فَتَبَارَكَ اللَّهُ أَحْسَنَ الْخَالِقِينَ That Allah, glory, to, glory, glory, glory be to Allah, Allah is the best of creators. Now the Holy Prophet ﷺ looked at him and said that, yes, this was the next verse that was revealed to me. And Abdullah bin Sarah thought that, oh, hold on, that this might be fabricated Billah, by the Holy Prophet ﷺ. So he left Islam. What did the Holy Prophet ﷺ do? Did he punish him? No. 
Did he send an edict against him of killings? No. He left him to how he was. Not just this, you look at Sulu Hudaybiyah. You know, there was a treaty being you know, coined by both between the Meccans and the Muslims. And one condition which was considered to be far, you know, so much against the, the Muslims, one was that if someone comes to, it comes to, uh, from Mecca to, to Medina, then the Medina people have to return them. Whereas someone who leaves Medina and goes back to Mecca, Meccas won't have to re return them. Again, shows you that if they reject Islam and apostatize from Islam, there was no punishment attached to it. So there's so many examples, Daniel, which show us what perfect example the Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was for us. Right, Jazakallah. Well, we have Amna Lone Saiba on the line. Assalamu Alaikum Wa Alaikum Assalam. I'm sure you've read the article and it's pretty shocking, isn't it, to see that a family in Britain is being persecuted for accepting Christianity. My question to you is, is there ever any ground for religious persecution in any country? Um. No, I, I, I've said that there's no ground for uh, religious uh, persecution. Um, I, it's really interesting. I'm just listening into your discussion, and uh, there is, you know, one of the basic tenements of Islam is that there is no compulsion in religion, and that we should be merciful and, and uh, compassionate and giving. And it is not for another human being that walks with us to judge. It is for Allah. And um, I think that we've got to be very, very careful when we uh, cast judgments like this, because. Um, it, 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 it's, it's not only has an impact on the people that you are that are suffering persecution, but it also has an impact on the faith and the wider uh, recognition of that faith as a peace, as a peaceful religion. Right. Well, Jazakallah, Amna Saiba. I guess what you're trying to say is it, it goes in hand in hand with a comment that we have on Twitter that if they accept Islam, then indeed they follow the right way, and if they turn back, your duty is only to convey the mas message, and that's from the Holy Quran. Jazakallah, Amna Saiba. Let's move on to our last piece for today. Now, th the title is Britain's Secret School for Teen Extremists. Now, it seems like there is a school or there's a madrasa in Britain. Which, in which the teachers are promoting extremism or inclining their students towards an extreme form of Islam where they are taught not to accept the Western values and not to have non-Muslim friends as non-Muslims as their, as their friends. So what's our opinion on this, gentlemen? Um, I think that um, the reason why people think that, you know, madrasas are teaching that is because we see that in our streets today, Muslim, you know, youth are going out and following such you know radicalized views and they are preaching them you know on social media and they're openly saying that we do uh, you know agree to jihad you know and killing of others um, i was just reading online recently and i went through i went you know i was looking at one of the research uh, papers by the government and it said that 166 of uk's muslim schools were actually spreading extreme teachings so there is you know it's clear that extremism and radicalization is taking place in within our schools here in the UK. So it's it's it is a huge issue. Right. If that's the case, and that's also a question that we have on Twitter, then why do we need madrasas in the UK? Or should we not just get rid of them? I mean, as you said earlier, we were speaking about there being you know a state shouldn't be involved with the religious uh, you know religion, but when national security is you know is at, at hand and is at risk, then measures have to be taken. Right. And to completely annihilate or to completely get rid of madrasas is, is completely wrong because we're not saying that all of the madrasas are actually teaching or preaching extremism or radicalization. But those who are, they should be monitored. And as Qudus Saib earlier on mentioned regarding the uh, president of Social Democ uh, Democratic uh, Party of Switzerland, he himself said that, you know, if national security is at risk, then we should monitor uh, the imams, you know, the mosques. In the same case, Madrasas should also be monitored and they should be seen whether they are preaching you know, hate and radicalization and extremism. So it should be monitored. I think it's all about uh, transparency, Daniel. I think that's the key message of Islam, that if you've got nothing to hide, then you should be transparent. And this is something which the Ahmadi Muslim community, you know, you know, so loudly says that come to our mosques, come to our educational institute seminar, uh, seminaries and see for yourselves what we're teaching, what we're preaching, what, how, what we're saying. 
And the best example in this day and age is, of course, Hazrat Khalifa al Masih al Khamis, the fifth caliph of the Promised Messiah. Alayhi salatu Only a few days back, when he was inaugurating a mosque in, in Regina, and he says it pretty much every time he inaugurates the mosque, that this mosque is not just for Muslims. Masjid, he was referring to the word masjid. That masjid actually refers to a place where you beseech God, you submit more towards God, and with humility, you try finding God. Nowhere in it says that you have to be a Muslim to go to a mosque. And this is the point that he was making, that this mosque is actually a place for the whole of society, for religion or no religion to fight, find peace. If you look at the Holy Quran, where Hazrat Abraham and Hazrat Ismail are mentioned where they're rebuilding the mosque or rebuilding the first, uh, first house of God. He said that this place will be a bed, a, a house, so that people can be at peace here. Now, if this is, these are the buildings that are promoting love, harmony, cohesion, tolerance, madrasas should also be in the same category. If you look at history, Islamic history, the first madrasas were in fact in mosques. And the first type of madrasa or the teaching of religion would happen in mosques, where people will convene for mosques, congregate for mosques, and afterwards we'll have small sittings and discuss religion. And of course, from, from one, it became a classroom environment and then these, this concept of madrasa started. So the term madrasa is not in actual fact derogatory. It's actually very, it's in, in, in Arabic, it means school. But unfortunately, because due to the practices of these Muslims and what they've done and they've complete, like I mentioned the hadith before, that the scholars, they're completely devoid of guidance. Because, because they're devoid of guidance, they don't refer to the Qur'an. They don't look at the sunnah of the Holy Prophet And what they pass on to the next generation is far-fetched and completely erroneous to Islam and contradictory with Islamic teachings. And hence it's important, like we've said before as well, that these places should be monitored as well. So that for the national, for the national security, interest of in national security. And it's not, it's like where I started off, it's about being transparent with, what, with your dealings. And you know, we have schools, universities across the world. We have one in the United Kingdom as well, known as Jamia in the UK. We, we all have an affiliation to that. Right, I was going to get, get to that. You mentioned that madrasas should be promoting peace, love and harmony. Does our madrasa in this country, Jamia in the UK, do that? Does it fall in that category? Of course, um, of course it does. I mean, especially as a Why as a do teacher? I say that as a teacher? Um, I'll come back to that. If you look at the results that it's producing, you become a graduate. We've had approximately 100 graduates from this very institute in the United Kingdom. They've traveled to over 20 countries of the world. And what are they doing? They're preaching and they're discussing the true teachings of Islam. Think about a ripple the effect that it lasts. Imagine Jamia being that nucleus of that ripple. And slowly but surely, it will eventually have an effect of all those people around it. That is the responsibility of Jamia, which Hazur Akhtas, Ayyadahullah Ta'ala blessings, is laid upon Jamia. And this was the reason why the Promised Messiah, alayhi salatu wasalam, he saw this in the future. And he laid the foundation stone to this very institute. So that not just scholars are born, but through enhancement in spirituality being the prerequisite and the key here, through spirituality, we can change the world's perception about Islam. And it's, it's being done so. I mean, as a teacher, I can say that more, spoke, more than focusing on education side, it's about nurturing the individual, not radicalizing them, nurturing the individual, telling them the right and wrong. Towards what end? Nurturing them towards what end? To what end? to becoming a positive figure in society and giving back to society. As discussed, Islam says that fulfill your rights to God and fulfill your rights to his creation. And person, an imam, imam literally means the one who leads from the front. His responsibility are just fulfilling these two object, objectives, huge objectives, not, not something easy. If he does this, then he's successful. And this is what Jamia is about. Right, so we just had a teacher's opinion on Jamia in the UK. Moshe Zafri Saab, you're studying in Jamia in the UK as a, as a student now for six years, mashallah. What's your opinion on this? Uh, Alhamdulillah, in Jamia we've 
provided ample opportunities to actually serve um, the local <coughs> local community, and we're fully absorbed in our local community. You know, there's so many fundraisers going on, blood donations, and all of this is being done by the by the khudam that are studying in Jamia and the UK. And we have so many opportunities. People go out for you know collecting collecting money for the poppy appeal, <coughs> food banks, and the local community has seen the efforts that we've made and they've applauded you know, those efforts and yearly we host an open house for the local community and as Gadoo Saab said that you know, we have to be transparent we open our doors to the local community and you know, mayors come, the local police, they come and they see that what we're teaching is completely different to what's been shown on media outlets so they come and they see that the way we treat them is completely you know, in accordance with the teachings of Islam and that's why I think that our um, madrasas, our schools are so different to others. We're so, you know, you know, we try our utmost to actually go out and teach the true teachings of Islam. And going back to Qudus Saab's um, point regarding Hazur's um, instructions, when Hazur came to the inauguration of Jamia in the UK in Hazelmere, Hazur said that we should be allowed to go out into the, into the local community and we should, you know, do silent tabligh. We shouldn't go and preach them that Islam is this and that, but we should show them out of our own character, out of our own, our own etiquettes, that this is what Islam is. And boys alhamdulillah go out and people do see that, okay, they, these are the guys from Jamia, all right, he's, he's another student of Jamia in the UK. And they've seen that, you know, we've tried our best to show and to change that view that people have, that perspective that people have about Islam. Right, well, community service aside, what is the biggest achievement that a student can achieve in Jamia and the UK? Um, in terms of, you know, the biggest achievement in my is to establish that, you know, link, that connection with the God Almighty. Um, you know, one can become, uh, you know, a huge scholar of Islam. And as the Holy Prophet yes. mentioned that, La yabka min al-Islam illa ismuhu, that there will be Islam, there will be ulama. And what did he say about the ulama? That they will be the worst under the, you know, the sun. So, Becoming a scholar is not the aim. The Holy, the Holy the Prophet of Islam came to reform the world. And he came to create a new heaven and a new earth. And what does that mean? It means to create such people when they, you know, when others see them, they take effect from them. You know, they see that these are the people of God and these are the people who God helps. And this is the exactly same, exact same thing that we see with, with, our, with, our, with our Khalifa, with like this. And when people go, he speaks so softly, you know, he, the, when he gives speeches, people listen to him. And after listening to him, they say, you know, he's a man of God and he truly is, you know... He, he wins their hearts. He wins the hearts, yeah. yeah the, the winning of the heart isn't due to his... Due, not just due to his scholarly approach, rather the pain and anguish that he has for humanity is reflected upon every single word he says. And that pain and anguish is something that every MD Muslim carries, that they want a better humanity. We're living in times of great, you know, turbul, you know, future. We don't know what the future holds with, with certain political movements and people coming to power. Yet, we still think, we still have huge amounts of uh, compassion and sympathy for humanity and, we want to, we, and the prayers for humanity are the reasons that we, we can be successful as, as a race. Just having a point, one more point about Jamia is it's not just in the United Kingdom that this is happening. Under the guidance of the Khalif of the time, it's happening across the world, whether it be you know, the Western Hemisphere or the Eastern Hemisphere, whether it be Africa, Europe, Asia, America, they all, you know, they have these institutes where boys, individuals are graduating and becoming an integral part of society so that they can promote peace and harmony and cohesion. And this is something which is only unique to the efforts of the community of the Prophet of Sayyidina Right, and Jazakallah panelists for today's programme. Viewers, unfortunately, we have run out of time. We must end this programme. Jazakallah for joining us. Leave us with your comments and questions during the week and join us for next week's programme via landline, Twitter, Instagram, and of course our email. Jazakallah again. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. <laughs> Islam kuch bhi ho Jayenge hum jahan bhi
करके जाना पड़े जाएंगे हम जहाँ बिके जाना पड़े हमें 